Well, Nehemiah chapter 9, and the wall has been built, revival is come. They wanted to practically simply obey the scripture, and it happened to be they were at the time of tabernacle. They had not done the simple thing of living in a little hut for seven days, then on the eighth day having a great feast of celebration. They hadn't done it since Joshua had first brought them into the land. So, my goodness, we're talking almost 600 years. That's a long drought to obey, huh? You got that you were doing bad. Um, uh, so we started in chapter 9, and after this Feast of Tabernacles, the people gathered together again. They, did, they weren't done. They weren't fed. They wanted to be fed more. They were hungry, and for they repeated again for six hours a day. Three hours a day, they would hear the Scriptures, and three hours a day, they would pray, repent, and praise. And um, it was in this cycle that Ezra comes out and a group of leaders with them, and he just starts blessing the Lord and the people bowing down and standing and lifting their hands, and they're worshiping. And, uh, and then this wonderful prayer of chapter 9, which is reciting the Jewish history in this prayer. And it's a repeated pattern. And it was clearly the point that Ezra, by the Holy Spirit, was wanting to drive home. What was that? God blessed them. They rebelled. God responded in His grace towards them. And Israel's history is no different than our history in the New Testament. We also are been blessed with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we rebel in our flesh and we, we learn this whole thing, don't we? We sort of go through our toddler years and then our junior high years and our high school years and and we're wrestling and going through various seasons of, of wrestling with our flesh and submitting ourselves to God. And a lot of times that ends up into a, a, a series of addictions and, and destructive ways that can happen and uh, repeated marriages to drugs to alcohol to sex addiction to gambling addiction. It can, it can look a lot of different ways. People go through the blender of this life and then eventually once again God responds and his loving kindness and tender mercies soften our heart and we come to repentance and we hope it's for the last time <laughs> we hope this cycle doesn't go again where it's God's goodness and we have another new season of rebellion or falling away or struggle or sinfulness or depression, or whatever it might be to cause us to get weak in our life, weak in our faith, weak in the inner man, and then God having to respond with even a deeper grace. But uh, it seems to be our human nature, doesn't it? And God knows our frame. And Psalms 103 tells us that. Don't forget His benefits. He forgives all your iniquities. Get an amen to that? He redeems your life from destruction. Perfectly put, boy, I can perfectly destroy my life. Even with the Lord in my life, I can still succeed. <laughs> Pretty well destroying it. But he crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercy. He goes on and says that he remembers we're just dust. And um, as a father pities his children, so he pities his us. Well, last week in the first 21 verses, we got the first part of the history. And that was God is the creator. God chose Abraham, made him into Abraham. Then the exodus from Egypt. And then God's faithfulness in the desert. We read about this. They were pretty rebellious out there in that desert. But in, in Nehemiah 9, let's just read those last few verses again. But you are God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness. And you did not forsake them. Even though they were complete beep in the wilderness. Those guys were horrible. Tired of the stinking manna. Bread right out of heaven. We want meat. We want 
you know, God brings the pheasants and they, it says in the Psalms, they ate, they got their flesh, but leanness in their soul. Oh, do I know that well? Getting my flesh, but then a leanness in my soul. You guys remember that they made molden calf and they worshipped it, wanted to take him back to Egypt. Yet in verse 19, yet in your manifold mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness, but the pillar of cloud didn't depart uh, by night, nor the pillar of uh, cloud, neither the pillar of cloud by night or the pillar of light, pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of cloud, the pillar of light by night. I knew I could say that if I eventually kept working on it. And, and in verse 20 it says, And you also gave them your good spirit to instruct them. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. I think that one of the most important sermons I have ever preached in my life was last Sunday morning, Ephesians 5.18, the command to be filled with the Spirit. We're going to talk a little more about it this week, but wow, God's good Spirit, His Holy Spirit who instructs, instructed them, who now lives in us and instructs us. Verse 21, 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Well, we continue on with this history and we're going to continue to see that pattern of rebellion and sin and God's compassion and grace. In verse 22, moreover, you gave them the kingdoms and the nations. So now they're crossing into the promised land to possess it. They went into that promised land and the kingdoms and the nations, uh, they end up dividing them into districts. The 12 tribes all took a section. They took possession of the land. The big guns were taken down, like Sion of the land of Heshbon, and uh, Og, the king of Bashan. Boy, these guys, that seemed absolutely impossible. God made it possible. And why they were there in that promised land, in verse 23, you also multiplied their children as the stars of the heaven. Remember, that was the promise to Abraham back in Genesis 15. And you brought them into the land which you had told their fathers to go in and possess. So the people went in and possessed the land, and you subdued them uh, and the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hands with their kings and the people of the land, and they might do with them as they wished. And they took strong cities and rich lands, possessed houses full of all the goods. This is one of God's blessings. He, he said, I, you're not going to have to go in and plant the trees. They're already going to be planted. You're not going to have to go build the house. It's already going to be built. And they're going to have to flee so quickly, they're going to leave the house with a pot roast on the oven for you, cooking when you walk in. And, uh, and this is what he goes on to say. Cisterns already dug. That's out of solid rock, by the way. Chip, chip, chip. And they make this giant hole. Uh, for the water to be held in all year long. And uh, they then also vineyards and olive groves and fruit trees in abundance. They were already prepared. They just took them over. And they ate and they were filled and they grew fat. Amen, I know about that. <laughs> and they delighted themselves in your great goodness. Wow. It's so easy to take God for granted and not remember all the great works He has done for us and in our life and given us And He realized the whole nation of Israel went through that at times. And it was a very scary place individually when we forget about all of God's rich blessings in our life. And we also as a nation forget that. David many psalms about that, but Psalms 44, 1 through 8, let's look at that. David says, We've heard of your ears, O God, our fathers have told us. We have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days. In the days of old, you drove out the nations with your hand, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples and cast them out, for they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did, they, did their own arm save them, but it was your right hand. It was your arm. It was the light of your countenance because you favored them. You are king, O God. 
command victories for Jacob. Through you, we will push down our enemies. Through your name, we will trample those who rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall I my sword save me. But you have saved us from our enemies and have put to shame those who hated us. In God, we boast all day long. Praise your name forever. Selah. Let's pause and meditate, he says. Boy, here he, he's in this prayer just thinking of all the great things God did and how incredible it was and, and how it was a first-class VIP service. And these guys literally just moved into these farms and didn't have to build them, didn't have to work hard at them. And the trees that often take years before they start producing had already been matured and produced and everything they could want. It was a built-in, matured land that they could just possess well, in verse 26, the pride of their hearts wouldn't allow it. Nevertheless, they were disobedient. They rebelled against you, cast your law behind their backs, and killed your prophets who testified against them to turn them to people have asked me from time to time. You know, the Bible calls us wicked. It says our hearts desperately, deceitfully wicked. Above all things, you can know it. Do you, do you really feel like you're a wicked person? I feel like I'm basically a good person. I'm like, dude, I, I don't know what you're thinking, but yeah, we're sinful with a big capital S. We're as wicked as wicked comes. I have not found that I'm good unless I'm comparing myself to men. Yes, I'm not in prison having murdered somebody, but that doesn't mean I'm a good person. And here it's he, he, he's saying, you guys know very well about this. And as I read this verse, I know very well it's true about me and my life as well. Verse 27, Therefore you deliver them into the hand of their enemies who oppress them. Now this is the book of Judges, right? You deliver them into the hand of the enemies who oppress them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried to you, you heard from heaven and according to your abundant mercies, you gave them deliverers who saved them from the hand of their enemies. If you read through Judges, you'll see seven different cycles of being in captivity and out of captivity. We have 13 different judges raised up at different times to help them, to deliver them in various degrees of captivity or oppression. But now we go and, and we see that in this pattern continued throughout the book of Judges. But in verse 28, now to 31, But after they had rest, they again did evil before you. Therefore you left them in the hand of their enemies, so they had dominion over them. And when they returned and cried out to you, you heard from heaven, many times you delivered them according to your mercies. This, this story repeated itself over and over and over again and testified against them. You, you basically spanked them and you, that you might bring them back into your law. You, you basically supported the enemy to conquer them because you rebuked them. You, you raised up more wicked nations than they were to oppress them to bring them back to your law. Yet, they acted proudly and did not heed your commandments, but sinned against your judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they shrugged their shoulders, stiffed their necks, and would not hear. Yet for many years you had patience with them, and you testified against them by your spirit and the prophets. Yet they would not listen. Therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples, of the lands back into captivity. We read that in Judges, right? Every man was doing what was right in his own eyes and, and boy, he just kept putting them in a horrible position. In verse 31, Nevertheless, in your great mercy, you did not utterly consume them nor forsake them. God, gracious and merciful. Such a, a pattern that we've seen in our life, haven't we? God forgiving us. We repent, and then we fall again, and God forgives us, and then we repent, and, and we just keep in this cycle of 
never again, God, never again. And then we do it again. God, I will be the most best person in the world starting tomorrow morning. And, and by 8 o'clock, we've already fallen. We sometimes feel as if God had forgotten, had gotten tired of us. We can't ask Him to forgive us for something. He has already forgiven us so many times before, can we? But God never gets tired of us, never turns away the repentant heart. We think, though, we think, oh man, this has been too many times. Do you know how many times I prayed this prayer for God to forgive me for that same sin? Do you know how many times I've fallen flat on my face and had to get up and be humbled and broken and, and, and repent? Yeah, lots. A lot more than should exist. <laughs> but yet, that's the pattern we see throughout history. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, I do not think they understood to the degree they were going to really put a life on Cain and Abel and then their grandkids and their great-grandkids all the way to present of what hardship sinful flesh would be. But boy, if Adam and Eve could see us now, I don't think they ever would have partaken of that <laughs> fruit because they really have put us in a predicament. And uh, this is why we call it the gospel, the good news. Because this is our God. Whether we fall one time or seven times, or 70 times seven, <laughs> we fall and sin daily. <laughs> He'll still forgive us. He'll still restore us. He'll still have mercy on us and bless us. Well, this same pattern continued throughout the kings until the present time in which they're praying. Now therefore, O God, the great and mighty and awesome God, who keeps covenant and mercy, do not let all the trouble seem small before you that has come upon us, our kings and our princes, our priests and our prophets, our fathers and all your people from the days of the king of Assyria until when? This day. I think back in the book of Judges, they were prideful in their heart and they rebelled against you and they disobeyed you and, and then another country, the Philistines or Gog or, me, or one of the other uh, Ammonites or Parasites or whatever in that area would conquer us and we'd be subservient to them. And, and of course now it's changed and grown until you've had these world ruling empires like Babylon and, and now the Assyrians at this present time. And, uh, and it's now not, not some little country putting them under this little local oppression. Now they're literally uprooted out of Israel, taken 450 miles away all the way to Iran today in the Syria area near Iraq and Iran and, and are held captive there. And they're spread throughout the whole world that Assyria had conquered at that time and and it was just a mess and Israel was not in the land just a little remnant and and most of the Jews had prospered in other countries and learned other cultures and other languages and they didn't want to come back to Israel ever as it is to this day the population of Jews is greater in New York City than it is the nation of Israel there's a lot more Jews in the world outside of Israel than there are a very small percentage in Israel as it is to this day. And so they're just saying, we can look back at our fathers and say, what idiots! They're so prideful! They're so disobedient! They didn't obey God! And now they had other countries ruling over them! Oh, that's our situation! What our fathers did hundreds of years ago, back in the time of the judges and back in the time of the kings, he repeated that history for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years until we are the cliché. We are exactly in the same pattern as our families before us 
How foolish. We read the history and go, Grandpa, you were such an idiot. Why were you so prideful? Why didn't you obey God? Why didn't you love God? Why didn't you worship God? Why didn't you submit to God? And look, it, it was horrible what you guys went through, through back a hundred years ago. But yet, now here they are in their present situation. It's identical. And they didn't get it until now. It's like, bing! That hard heart and that rebellious spirit and that unworshipful, unthankful spirit that our forefathers had that we used to look down our nose going, if I lived during that time, I would have been the obedient one. If I lived during that time, I would have listened to that prophet. But now I realize as Ezra is praying and reciting this history that we just read for many, many hours, for many, many days, I, I realize it's me. I am that rebellious person. I am that unworshipful, unthankful, sinful person. Notice in verse 33. However, you are just in all that has befallen us. For you have dealt faithfully. We have done wickedly. Boy, note that verse 33. That is the sound of a person who is right with God. This is what true confession is. God, you are right. Me, I am wrong. I've done wickedly. You in your nature have stayed faithful and consistent and just and fair. And sometimes that means punishment and spanking to, for our best to bring us back to where we should be. I receive that. You're righteous and faithful and just and pure. I am the one who's done wickedly. That's confession. The word confession literally means to just be in agreement with. Do you remember that story in Luke 18? Jesus told the parable. He said there were two men praying. One was a Pharisee and one was a tax collector. You guys remember this story? And the Pharisees, thank you, Lord. I'm not like that tax collector over there. Thank you that I tithe. Thank you that I'm, I pray. Thank you that I'm... And the tax collector didn't have much to say. He just groaned and beat his chest and said, God, I'm a sinner. After they prayed, they left. And Jesus said, which one of them left righteous? He said, I tell you, it was the tax collector. In 1 John verse 8 and 1 John 1 verse 10, 1 John 1.8 1 and 1 John 1.10, 1 it says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive our sin us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar in his word is not in us. 1 John 1, nine. But if we confess, we come in agreement with God about, he says, our sins. What is it? Here's our sins. Forgive me for being angry at you, God, because you have dealt faithfully. From my wicked standing, I thought you were the prude. I thought you were the Pharisee. I thought you were being mean and harsh and, and, and not giving me what I wanted, when I wanted, how I wanted, and you were not the dad you know I wanted. But now I realize it's because I was being wicked that I thought all those things about you. You were being wonderful. You were being perfect. It was me and my wicked, sinful heart in the midst of my sinfulness wanting just to my selfish ways and you to bless me as I can and help me aid me to be more selfish and self-centered and sinful. But if we'll just come into agreement with God about our sins, you know, that may be a feeling, it may not. It could just be intellectual. Sometimes we cry and sometimes we wish we would cry. 
Sometimes we feel sorry for doing things wrong. I know I did wrong still. I just don't feel bad about it. And I feel bad that I don't feel bad, I think. No, I wish I felt bad about not feeling bad. Our feelings are all over the place, aren't they? But we can agree. Yes, God calls that sin, and I call that sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, if you have that confession heart, God, you're righteous. I am the sinner. God just, he comes in like a flood. He doesn't get his little wash rag and get a little corner of it wet and, and clean the little sin spot in your life. He just opens up the floodgates and just, you know, brings tons of cleaning fluid upon you and and we're just like, man, I just confessed this one sin. I know, but I love that heart of confession. I'm cleansing you from all unrighteousness. Isn't God good? Alan Redpath says this, It is a tremendous moment in a Christian's life when he can honestly look up into the face of God and say, Yes, Lord, you are right and I am wrong. When he, spots, when he stops arguing with God and drops his controversies, he says, Lord, yes, I've got what I deserved in this situation. You are right. I am wrong. That is the thing for which God has been working in your life and mine from the very moment of our conversion. Aren't you thankful that God doesn't give up on us? He keeps chipping away. <laughs> Even though we're a hard nut to crack, he's not stopping. We'll continue on in verse 34. Neither our kings, nor our princes, our priests, or our fathers have kept your law, nor heeded your commandments and your testimonies with which you testified against them. Boy, he's stepping on some toes here, isn't he? Our kings, our princes, our priests, none of them obeyed you. Ouch, ouch, ouch. What's that? That one little old lady said, Pastor, you stepped all over my toes today. And the pastor said, I'm sorry, I was trying to step all over your heart. Well, he's stepping all over toes and hope it's reaching the hearts. Verse 35, for they have not served you in their and many good things that you gave them, or in the large and rich land which you set before them, nor did they turn from their wicked works. Verse 36, here we are servants today or enslaved here we are slaves today it's not some historical past thing that hasn't happened in hundreds of years our fathers are slaves in egypt we're enslaved right now in jerusalem our fathers were enslaved by the philistines in the book of judges and others throughout the times of the kings and here we are now and to the Assyrians, we're slaves today. And the land that you gave to our fathers to eat its fruit and its bounties, this land flowing with milk and honey, it's not flowing right now. Here we are, servants in it, slaves in it. And it yields much increase to the kings you, you, you have set over us. They, they're getting it, huh? Because of our sins. We are having to give the spoils of this land to a pagan, wicked, idolatrous king. Not because you're unjust or unfaithful or unfair, because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies, over our cattle, at their pleasure. And we are in great distress. Israel at this time was not an independent nation they were a providence of empire of Persia. They were under heavy Persian taxes and obligations. They asked God to deliver them once again from this oppression. Well, verse 38, final verse here tonight. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it. Our leaders, our Levites, our priests, they seal it. So here are the sure signs of revival. This is what we see. Brokenness of heart over sin. Number two, 
reflection on God's goodness. Number three, recognition of our sinfulness. And then finally, a renewal of our obedience, or a renewal to obey. How did they do this renewal? Israel needed to come to this place to recognize who God is, to recognize who they are. Now making the covenant with God. What is that covenant? To commit themselves to God's ways. And in this case, that meant even writing it down. So we're going to get to chapter 10, and we're going to see these guys writing it down. But in the New Testament, we also make covenants. Well, no, Jesus said don't make a vow. I know, but we really can't not do it. I mean, he, he basically said do it very selectively. But if you've been married, you made a wedding vow. If you dedicated your child, you made a vow to the Lord that you'll raise them up in the Lord. We find that Paul led us as Christians into covenants, vows, desires, whatever you want to call them. He says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, no longer I live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He is saying, this is the covenant I am making to live this crucified life and no longer me and my wants and my desires, but I want all of God's desires met through my body. Boy, Philippians 3, another, whew, you've you got to be mature. Matter of fact, he ends this, I don't have it on here, but in verse 15, if you're not mature and this sounds too heavy to you, let it go. Just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> but if you're a mature believer... He says, here's my passion, and maybe it'll be in agreement with you. I don't know. But now that I have, not that I've already attained, but already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which I, Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself I've apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind it, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press forward to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. Well, the application today, number one, let's allow God's word to affect us and change us. Let's really pray when we get into God's word. I don't know if that's morning or nighttime or middle of the day, whenever it is for you. Just say, Lord, please let your Holy Spirit affect me with it. I don't want to just read it like I do a newspaper. I I don't want to just hear it like I would hear the news of, of what's happening. I want it to affect me and my spirit. Number two, realize that it is God's blessing upon us that brings the victory. Without God's blessing, we may have earthly victories, but we're not going to have spiritual, eternal victories. Number three, not in this passage, but greater revelation in the New Testament, we come to know that real fruitfulness comes from abiding in Christ. Thus let us receive God's grace and press on in abiding in Him. That's really where they don't really make it in the Old Testament (laughs) to that what Jesus taught us in John 15. Abide in me and I in you. But that's really the greater revelation of of where we want to be led as a believer, huh? So as we uh, go into prayer here right now, this is a time to to be thankful, to, to remember the history of God's faithfulness in our youth. God's faithfulness in our lives throughout decades. We probably remember some pretty sinful, destructive seasons that God kept us from utter destruction by His gracious hand. We probably have that testimony of falling short and suffering the consequences in many different times and many different ways of our foolish flesh. And we're amazed that we're here right now saying, God, not my will, but thy will be done. It's quite a miracle. So let's thank him. And then let's pray for revival in our own souls and in our church, in our community, and unto Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. But let's jump right in.